Okay, I think we're going to get started. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, session on circular design. My name is Joe Isles. I'm the editor of Circulate, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's uh, news channel, and I'm delighted to be hosting this session on, on circular design, a hugely important topic that we've heard quite a lot about already today. The, the word design has cropped up in many of the sessions, and it's hardly surprising um, that the Ellen MacArthur Foundation has been working with different uh, definitions or an evolving definition of the circular economy for around seven years now. But one consistent point is this term design. And we, we think of the circular economy as a model for an economy that's regenerative and restorative by design. So it's already highlighted in that process, uh, in, in that definition. But but we've heard about it throughout the day, both from Ellen MacArthur, who mentioned about going right back to the beginning when we're thinking about uh, new circular solutions for fashion. Uh, so going back to that design phase. Also, in the fantastic Pulse of the Fashion Industry report, which I'm sure you've all uh, been consuming uh, this week, uh, design is mentioned as a, as a really key uh, phase where circular economy and the principles of a circular economy can start to be considered. Um, so it's, it's everywhere. One thing that I think is maybe worth, I, I hope to hear a bit more about today, is it's not just about products. Uh, the, the, our understanding of design, especially in relation to a circular economy, but, but, but more broadly as well, is evolving from the, just the design of a single product and its, and its materials to, to services and systems. So thinking of, of products in, a, in that wider system is, is hugely important, is integral to the transition to a circular economy. So looking at the design phase enables us to move from end of pipe solutions, just doing less bad, as Bill McDonald was talking about, to new opportunities for innovation and regeneration. But it is a relatively new term, circular design. I think only this year um, it's really kind of crept up the agenda uh, with the release of the circular design guide uh, earlier this year, which we've uh, heard a bit more, we'll hopefully hear a bit more about. So in this session, hoping to find out what circular design is, what we mean by it, how do, how do brands do it, who, who is doing it now, what are some good examples of circular design? And to help me explore this topic, I'm delighted to be joined by a fantastic panel with me. Uh, we have Annie Gullingsrud, who heads up the Fashion Positive Initiative at Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute. She has a background in fashion design, sustainability and marketing communications, and has been sustainability, direct, sustainability director, a consultant, writer, and designer, and worked with brands like Gap and many more, I'm sure. We have Cecilia Takayama, one of two Cecilias on the, on the panel today. That is going to get confusing. I think it's a once in a blue moon event. Um, Cecilia is the director of the Materials Innovation Lab at Keering. Uh, Keering will need no introduction for many of you, um, but they're a group of luxury brands, including Gucci, Saint Laurent, uh, Stella McCartney, and so on. The Materials Innovation Lab supports the integration of, of new and sustainable materials into Keering's brands. We have Chris Grantham. Uh, the C portfolio, Circular Economy Portfolio Director at IDEO, who heads up IDEO's consultancy business on the circular economy and works on organization systems change and breakthrough innovation. Chris work, has worked on a number of design initiatives on the circular economy alongside the Ellen MacArthur Foundation as a, as a design partner, including the aforementioned Circular Design Guide. And finally, the second Cecilia, Cecilia Strombad Branston, who's the Circular Economy Lead at H&M. Uh, group. She's a sustainable business expert on the circular economy and materials and leads work on this super ambitious commitment for H&M to go 100% circular uh, by 2030, which includes uh, the approach to how products are made, so back again designed, uh, and using recycled or sustainably sourced materials. She's also worked on the garment collection programs, which uh, many of you will be aware of, and various closing the loop initiatives. So welcome to our panel. Thank you. <laughs> and to get the ball rolling, I'd really like to get a perspective on this term circular design. As I say, it is a relatively new term. Does it mean just making products last longer or so they can biodegrade or be repaired? Uh, so I'm going to ask each of the panelists in turn, what does circular design mean to you? And Annie, maybe you can get us started. I can. And um, I just want to pause and say this is a very exciting moment. There's looks like over 100 people in the room right now talking about circular design, and 
I've been waiting for this moment for a while, so welcome. Um, circular design, paying special, special attention to the materials that we're sourcing, ensuring they're optimized to cycle over and over, having an intention for where they go next, and a partnership and relationship to help us steward that process to its next phase. Great, that was beautifully concise. So, highlighting the materials. Cecilia? Well, I think it's a, it's a multifaceted uh, term because, for example, from a luxury perspective, we make, we make products that are, are beautiful, that have craftsmanship, that have extremely high quality, and they're items to which we have an emotional and can have an emotional attachment. So they're things that you want to hand down from generation to generation. And this, I think, is part of circular design. Um, but I think also that there's uh, a need to look for a closed loop model, which is at the moment a bit of the holy grail to look for something that can uh, recycle items that have blended, blended materials, which is not able to be techni technologically done today. So I think that is also part of circular design. But I think also fundamentally it means looking down at the raw materials. Where are the materials originally coming from? and understanding that supply chain that brings up those raw materials into the products. Thank you. Chris? Well, I guess in my world, thinking a little bit more about perhaps the role of, of, of design in the context of circular economy and, and, um, and, and products and services and systems, which is kind of what we, what we uh, try to get creative about at, at IDEO. I guess um, uh, for me, it's, it's, it's uh, about fundamentally about value creation, about shared value creation, it's about bringing people into loops with brands, which is a very, very powerful thing. I think it's also about the design process becoming continuous. It's, it's about moving, from be moving beyond a sort of beginning, middle, and end to the design process, and in it becoming continuous, um, discovering a fantastic opportunity to learn about what works and doesn't work at a systems level. Um, and I think it's, it's asking some different questions about how we design, and there's some intriguing opportunities arising in the design process for embedding intelligence, for example, to acquire more data, to enable circularity, and things like that. So I think for me it's about an interesting sort of continuous design <coughs> process and learning opportunity that can help us deliver more shared value creation. And finally, Cecilia. Yeah, there's Cecilia with the most complicated <laughs> last name, a Swedish, by the way. Yeah, I guess with the risk of repeating what everybody else said and what we heard this morning, but circular design is really about designing for an endless life. You need to really take the whole life cycle into account in the design process. So it's everything about quality, longevity, as we heard from uh, Cecilia Takanyama. It's about the intended use, but also the intended next use. And I think that's a really important factor here. So quality, longevity, choosing the right materials, choosing the right chemicals to material health perspective, choosing the right production processes, and of course ensuring an endless life through different kinds of uh, reuse and, and finally recycling. So in short, that's circular design for me. As a moderator, that's, I mean, that's, that suite of answers is probably about as uh, is, is a dream come true, really. So we've got <laughs> materials, emotional connection, durability, value creation, and designing for multiple uses. It's clear that circular design does have many facets to it, and uh, let's, let's get a bit deeper into it now. Um, in, the, uh, in the Pulse of the Fashion Industry report, there's, it's clear that there are a lot of other pressures on designers when they're, um, when, they're, when they're just choosing materials, for example. Um, the, this design to cost uh, notion is, is mentioned as, a, as, a, as a, at odds with other, other methods of designing, such as employing circular design. So how can we encourage the adoption of a new approach to, des to design? Annie, I'm going to start with you. Obviously, Cradle to Cradle have been doing that for a number of years, encouraging people to take into account a different set of priorities at the design phase. How can you encourage a business to do that? The methodology of Cradle to Cradle was created for the designer. And um, I am a trained designer, and I've worked as one. And I, there were certain things I struggled with, too. And, and it really started with not knowing what, what materials I had. And um, the sort of foundation for, for the design for me was the fabric. And it was the fiber, and it was the drape, and the function. And I had no idea where to get these materials. And I had, you know, I'd see these um, 
labels, and there, there's tons of them, and I just, like, I had no idea what they were, and I was perplexed. And uh, the, the foundation, the foundation to me, I mean, there's so much further along, but the foundation is a proper material selection. You know, uh, we're talking about circular design, which means we're talking about the circular economy, which there's an assumption that these materials are going to be circulating continuously. And, you know, why would, it, why would we want to circulate crap? Mm -hmm. Why would we want to circulate contamination and dirtiness? We just, that just doesn't make much sense. So the, the power is in, uh, in, and we're talking about, I think, from designers in large and small companies, the power is, is material selection. And depending on what type of company you're in and what type of resources you have, um, you can... You know, from there, when we think about where is this going next, like how how are we doing this? Where is it? Who is it going to? After it goes here, where is it going next? And um, as as long as the designer is aware that there's a next, 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 that there's a there's an intrinsic value and uh, delight, you know, as as our founder mm -hmm. Bill McDonough says, in in the materials, and we're handing those molecules off to the next phase. As long as we know that that exists, we can find the right people uh, in the world, wherever those things end up, to help us sort of uh, process and steward that thing to its next phase. It sounds like it's almost um, creating an, a kind of abundance of information. So you have, you have access to as much information or, that you, you maybe didn't in the past about the materials, what material options, where the product goes, and, and surfacing that is a, is a first step. Right, and that's, that's why I work where I work, because I was frustrated. You know, I, I felt like I couldn't trust anybody. And um, I've written a book that just came out this year, and I created a library of misinformation, because I saw a repetition of phrases like, cotton is the thirstiest crop. And I was just like, w is it true? Like, what? You know, and I kept questioning these things. And so then I started at the Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute, and we have a standard, we have a verification for these materials that say, according to renewable energy, water stewardship, social fairness, chemistry, and reuse, this is how it rates, and it's, it's a standard. You know, so we have created an open source public library where designers can pick and choose from those materials and we're growing that library mm -hmm. with our fellow apparel um, member companies, you know, such as the ones on the stage. And, and Chris, uh, you work with brands as well and, and often encourage them to uh, or work with them whilst they implement significant change, um, more recently around circular economy. It can seem really daunting, I think, and, with, and when we hear phrases like changing the whole system, which is uh, an amazing goal and is, uh, is so um, important when we think about circular economy, but, but that can make it seem even more overwhelming. How, how do you help a brand get started with, with circular design? Yeah, and a lot of businesses break off uh, smaller pieces to chew, of course, that are maybe representative of some important issues, but are not necessarily, and some important, important challenges, some systemic challenges, they're not necessarily the whole business. Uh, typically, businesses also look at creating, you know, venture labs, and, and, and we do a lot of that kind of work, where there's more sort of space and freedom to play, it's lower risk. I think ultimately, you know, the design thinking approach <coughs> we espouse at IDEO is very much about trial and error. It says, don't be afraid to fail, um, you know, as you as you start to develop your ideas and prototype them, test them, get feedback, find out what's working, and, and the circular design addition to that is develop a systems perspective, as we've been saying already. <coughs> so, you know, try and understand what effect you're having on the system. Now, you know, in doing that, you start to learn about what's working, what isn't working. Are we delivering kind of circular value? Are we creating the shared value, the business value, the societal value, whatever it is? Um, and are we building our confidence in that process? So, so what, what we're, we're learning what works, what doesn't work. We're building our confidence. And that's incredibly important when tackling these. Creative confidence is very important when tackling these systemic challenges. I think the other thing I would just say is that, um, you know, uh, 
uh, purpose is important, <laughs> actually. So, um, you know, it's very hard for a business to make these kinds of changes if they don't believe in, if, if they just want to make money. No one, no one really does, but a lot of businesses work like that. Mm. No, no, people very rarely just want to make money. So it's about how do, you, how do you access that purpose as a business purpose and have it as an operational, uh, almost capability in the end, so that you can, you can actually say, well, we're gunning for shared value creation here. So that's, that's the value we're looking to kind of get to. And I think then that allows you to make some sort of bigger decisions, because this stuff does affect, can affect, when it's uh, truly embedded all, all of the business, all of the functions of the business. Thank you. And let's get an idea of, from the, of, of the purpose from the business, from the brand side. Kiering, and uh, so from you, Cecilia, why would a business pursue a, this different way of designing or different way of approaching design? Well, I think it's part of uh, a long-term strategy. And I think that uh, there's only so, there's a limited, finite, finite amount of resources out there. And so it's part of having to make a business that can sustain itself in the long run. And I think that uh, um, it means what's, the, what's challenging also is trying to move towards a paradigm of internalizing external costs which today is not able to happen until you start looking through the supply chain and really making those changes that can embed it within your supply chain so that it can work in the end because it can't just work with just having, uh, you know, recycled innovative materials is fantastic, you know, but if you don't have a sustainable business of that in and of itself to pull it through the supply chain and have paradigm changes, it won't succeed. So I think that's essential. And we heard some quite surprising uh, statistics, uh, again, from the research released this week about the um, economic disadvantage that could be on the horizon if businesses don't change. If, if that pinch isn't being felt quite so severely yet, is, is getting others to think in the same way, is, is that a challenge? Is that, is that difficult? Absol absolutely, because... Uh, one company can only do so much. And for example, especially in the fashion industry, we don't own our supply chains. So we have to depend on the collaborations and the cooperation and frankly, negotiations we have with our suppliers and our sub-suppliers and our sub-sub-suppliers in order to make those changes that will actually embed it in the supply chain and make it something that will work. And from H&M's perspective, is this, I mean, some of this probably uh, around uh, long-term viability strikes a chord. Is there, what, what are the other factors in terms of that go into deciding 100% circular by 2030? Yeah, and I think for us, it's really, uh, we're truly convinced that circularity will be the only way to go in order to stay successful in, in business, actually, going forward. Looking five, ten, even... 20 years ahead, if we want to be there, we really need to go away from this linear model of take, make and dispose and, and creating waste. So I think from our perspective, we have a really strong circular agenda that we want to prove with this 100% circular vision. And we really see that we need to decouple growth from the youth of virgin resources and finite resources for a lot of different reasons. And all of them have been mentioned already, population growth, resource scarcity, and of course, a huge waste of resources. We are treating the resources in a, in a very unsustainable way today. So therefore, we have this commitment to 100% circular. And with 100% circular, what do we mean then? Um, we mean that we will have a circular approach to how fashion is made and used. And that basically means that we need a systemic change to the way that fashion is made and used. And that will incorporate the whole life cycle, as I explained when explaining what is circular design. So it's about design, of course. It's about material choices, production processes, and different ways of expanding the lifespan of the product. So taking this holistic approach is very important. But above that, we see that the use of resources it's so important, so we also set this goal of only using recycled or other sustainably sourced materials by 2030. And I think by doing that, we could also take, show, that, show this commitment to the supply chain, to the industry as such, and hopefully others will follow, because as, as Cecilia Takanyama said, we, we cannot do this alone. We need the systemic change will only happen if the whole industry joins, but we want to take a leadership position in that. And of course, that entitles for our products, but we also work a lot on circularity for our 
non-product, so to say, what we don't sell. So we have, for example, developed a circular design tool together with the Ellen McCart Foundation for our in interior materials, so we can set a kind of ground level look at where we are today, but also look at the different improvement areas that we have. So I think setting these tangible, real goals will really be the way forward to, to achieve this change, and it would also be a way for us to make it happen within our company, but also towards the, the industry. I want to take a, just a quick di diversion from the script and just ask about, um, obviously, the two brands we have uh, on stage have very different product types, or, or, or um, we've heard about kind of durability, handing down clothes, but and then uh, H&M's um, brands, perhaps more of a, a high street uh, brand, uh, materials that are designed to be recycled, <coughs> maybe that comes into it a bit more in the design phase. Can you comment on perhaps the different design approaches that you see bearing that in mind, bearing those different product types in mind? Well, I think for a luxury, it, it comes down to a lot about the quality, because if you don't have the highest quality, I mean, we were exigent about quality and, uh, and also aesthetics. And ultimately, this is what uh, drives the creativity um, and, uh, and individual designers, of course. Um, and if we don't have the, the right type of materials, we can't sacrifice that. And we can't just say that just because it's a new innovative material and it's circular, but we're going to have to sacrifice a lot of quality. In the long run, that's not enhancing circular design unless you go for the, the, the best quality that you can get and the best aesthetics that you can get. If it's not pleasing, it won't, it won't work. I think we fully agree. I, I mean, quality is crucial. And quality, even though we have lower prices, quality is, is, is part of our business idea to provide fashion and quality at the best price in a sustainable way. So I think it's not about, I think there's not one recipe to this. There would be a lot of different ways of designing for circularity, depending on the intended use, of course. You will still need long kind of lasting products that will last for decades, but you will also want this kind of high fashion, maybe the it color for the, the system, but then you have to choose the right design, the right materials for that process, the right production process, and the right kind of next life. Maybe they are biodegradable, and I think Mr. Future Fashion is actually doing some interesting research on this, on circular design, but I think we have a lot of brands in our portfolio as well, and with different kind of price ranges, and there will be different recipes mm. on how we tackle the circular approach in these different brands. And we don't have a clear solution yet, but I think the steps we have taken with the garment collecting program, um, with the circular design approach on, on, on different, on both our products, but our interior products, and the holistic approach with quality, longevity, and, and things like that, choosing only recycled or sustainably sourced materials. They are kind of stepping stones, but we're still working on the final kind of recipe for the most delicious <laughs> meal that we will provide the circular. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and, and that point around there being a multitude of different approaches to this, at the start we were saying about how this could be, well, certainly from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's perspective, as much about business model design as product design. We've spoken quite a lot about materials, and, and um, this is my first time at the Copenhagen Fashion Summit. It's been a big topic of discussion throughout the day, but the materials, where they come from, sourcing. How do you approach business model innovation versus material innovation? Because, uh, Annie, you mentioned around, uh, around materials, obviously a huge part of Cradle to Cradle. If you could design the best products in the world, if you can't get it back and do something with it, uh, are you wasting your time? Right. Right. So we've had the last, I don't know, this, this sustainability in fashion hasn't been around for too long. Um, but we've collected a lot of data and uh, experience with what has worked and what hasn't worked. And we're shifting from sustainability into circular apparel and circular economy. So let's all go there, right? And, and as, we, as we shift into this vast, big world, um, there's a lot of branches that come out. I mean, if you've seen the, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation has this, this butterfly, 
right? That shows the biological side, the technical side, and all, everything in between, the reuse, the disassembly. Ah, like, what do I do? And I think as um, all of us are going to have uh, our, our own needs, each company is going to have really unique needs. Uh, and certainly, we have our commonalities, you know, and the goal is to find our commonalities, springboard from that, scale and accelerate, because we're power more, much more powerful together when we find those. And then we understand, hey, um, what is it that, that our individual company wants and needs and what's best? And that's, that's where um, you get to be creative and, and leverage. And this is that, the key word, I think, of today, relationship, partnership, collaboration, is you can't do it alone. And, and I don't want to. It's, it's not very fun. Um, nor do I think that I can do it alone, but I certainly have mo much more fun together. And it's to identify the areas of, you know, if it's disassembly, if it's, you know, take back, if it's, if it's reuse. There are so many, uh, uh, just uh, so many companies now that can help you. And, and a key word here is scale. It's scale. We can't, we can't do this without scale. You know, we can't do this without scale, you know. And so, and, and that's going to require help. Definitely collaboration high on the agenda, and we'll, uh, we'll come on to it in a few moments. Chris, business model innovation, I mean, you and I, I think when I, we first started working together, I kind of thought IDEO, they design, they design products, they design stuff. But it's really, um, I, I realize it's less and less about that, but more around designing a, a, a service or system that works. How do you, when you work with brands, approach both those areas? Yeah, I mean, that systemic awareness, and we, we, was the, you know, the other speakers have sort of touched on lots of that, so I won't sort of dwell on that too much, but yeah, thinking about how do you design to enable a larger system of users, so we go from being sort of user-centered to being multiple user-centered or more system-centered, if we're thinking about how the materials potentially have a use, if we design them right and we select the right materials, to your point, you know, how can they be useful to more people within the economy, more, more businesses. Um, so that's all, I guess, a part of it. But then also, how do we create more valuable relationships, which is obviously a key part of the business model building process. So, you know, potentially, if we're moving to a brand retaining the ownership of those assets, uh, and leasing them to a user, that might enable that user to be able to afford a higher quality level of product. I would do a lot of work in, in the, well, the coffee machines area, as you know, Joe, so that, that, that's potentially a, a way that they can access a better experience through a different, different business model, um, potentially offering them more choice of experiences as well. So there's lots of things that you can, you can say, well, that will create more value if we adopt a sort of circular model in terms of more valuable relationships. And then, the, then there's, I mean, we use the business model canvas at IDEO, and we're looking at how do we evolve that to be more circular. So there are just some different business model generating considerations. So thinking about the values of different kinds of partnerships, and obviously partnerships, as we've been saying, absolutely key. Thinking about um, different assets. So if you invest in and generate more natural capital, more social capital, more human capital, how do you then value that on a, on a, on a business model canvas? And, and what, what, I, what extra value can that bring to your business? So it's thinking about assets a bit differently, thinking about partnerships a bit differently, um, and uh, you know, I think that's 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 an interesting sort of a new sort of uh, a, a sort of experience, I suppose, as part of part of designing business models. Is you've got different assets, different partnerships, different things to consider that can generate value. And you mentioned the business model canvas, the the circular design guide uh, uh, developed between the foundation and IDEO, uh, with input from Cradle to Cradle and and, and tested with mm -hmm. many businesses mm -hmm. and students and so on. Uh, there's the butterfly diagram with its many loops. How those sorts of kind of references, tools, that, is that at odds with this idea that there isn't a one size fits all? There isn't just a guide you can pick up and go, hey, let's just apply this. This is the most obvious option. It, 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 it's, it's never that easy, is it? No, I mean, the, the, the design is a, is a, is a bloody, tear-inducing, messy mm -hmm. process. That's the truth of it. And that's yeah. the best thing about it. And of course, it's not about filling in boxes on a business model canvas. You, you, you know, you, the business model canvas is, is, is not going to necessarily help you to, do, to generate the ideas. It might be a great place to ca capture some information for your boss or something. But you know, what you need to be doing is, is kind of getting out there, building stuff, testing stuff, and finding out what works and understanding where value lies in a very kind of up-close, personal way with it uh, in, the, in the market. And that's the, that's the best way to learn, yeah. And uh, uh, we have two businesses who have uh, learned through that way. H&M, 
in terms of getting stuff back, uh, people are aware of the recovery um, boxes that are in, in stores to recover textiles. But w what have the group learned about exploring circular design, either at the product level or the, uh, or, or the, or the service level, system level? What have they learned and what are the challenges? I think we, so far, I think we're at the really beginning of this journey. So, of course, we already made some great learnings, but we also see that there are some really big challenges that we need to kind of deal with to get this systemic change happen. And I think, yeah, from the Garment Collecting Initiative, we have learned a lot, of course, and we have constantly increasing volumes of textiles, but I think it has taken some time, and we will still take some time to raise the awareness that we're actually doing it. Because it's still, it's still, even though we've done it since 2013, it's still not widely spread, and we, but we have also set goals now on how to reach the volumes that we want, and we have collected 45,000 tons so far, so we have, we have made a huge progress, and also I think involving the customers as we do with the Garment Collecting Initiative is a really good way to, to spread the awareness, and they feel that they can be part of the solution, but I think Looking to the challenges, I think looking from a design perspective, taking design for recyclability as an example, I think today it's basically impossible to design for recyclability because the only scalable recycling technology out there is mechanical recycling of cotton and wool. And I think none of you would only like to wear 100% cotton clothes with 100% cotton thread or 100% wool clothes with 100% wool thread because what do you do when it rains or when it's super cold and you're going skiing? I don't know, you need <laughs> other materials. And so it's really hard, I think. But scaling innovation, accelerating innovation is a really important focus area for us. And it should be for the industry. And we're talking about it together as well. And the Circular Fiber Initiative will also look into that. So scaling innovation, both on recycling technology, but also on, on recycled or sustainably sourced other materials. It could be residues from other other industries, we heard about the orange fiber or the grape leather. Uh, so it's about sorting technologies. It's about innovation on a lot of different areas that need to happen. So that's something that we try to accelerate with the Global Change Award, for example, or investing in, mm -hmm. in recycling companies like Warn Again. And from Kering's perspective, the, the, the learnings from exploring this area? I think that it's... Uh, it's difficult to have transparency within our supply chains, but it's possible. And uh, it's essential to get down into the raw material stages to see where you can make those changes. Um, because if you just are looking at the top part of the, of the supply chain, it, it, most, of the, most of the impact's already been done. So uh, you need to get back really down to the roots of where is the material coming from. It's the cotton fields. It's the, so sheep farms, these are the places where the impact is high, uh, is very, very high, and it's where we need to make a lot of the changes. And so I think we've had a lot of learnings about how we can go that deep into the supply chain. And it's, uh, frankly, it's quite rare on, uh, on the fashion side to go that, that deeply into the supply chain, that profoundly deep, and to make those changes there. So that's a big learning. And just a, a question about your role at the Materials Innovation Lab, which has obviously, I, th I read there was like a th a, some sort of thousands of different materials that you uh, kind of have almost experimented with there. H how, at the same time, diversity of materials seems to be a bit of a challenge th in terms of volumes and sorting. H how do you decide that an, a new material is so good or so useful that it should be incorporated? Well, I think it's all about looking at through from the raw material all the way through, seeing what what is the impact of that on your natural capital. What is that? What is the impact of that from a compliance point of view, uh, from a chemical point of view, um, and certifications point of view, and standardizations and certifications for that matter are yeah. quite important in order for companies and brands to be able to make that differentiation of what really is sustainable and what isn't. Um, and I think the more options that we can have of better and more beautiful and more quality materials, the better off we are. And, uh, and, and it's challenging because a lot of innovative materials that may come up, if they're not economically viable, uh, it's very difficult to try to integrate them into a supply chain. 
Um, and, and that's why a lot of our work is also done in, in trying to make those changes within the supply chain, working with our suppliers and people who can transform the supply chain and who have the ability to transform that supply chain. And we have to exert our influence, therefore, to pull, that, pull it up through that way. I have two questions left for our fantastic panel. Uh, if you have questions on circular design, we will have a few minutes left at the end uh, to ask them, so prepare your questions now. Um, since uh, supply chain came up, collaboration is, uh, is, is a key point. Businesses can't do, can't do this by themselves. Where are some of the hotspots for collaboration? I'm going to open this up to, the, to all of you, um, so it'll be f fastest finger first. Um, Pre-competitive collaboration <coughs> across sector, uh, supply chain <laughs> collaboration, there's lots of options. Annie. Sorry, I can't help it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, in the last several years of working with Fashion Positive and the Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute, I just, I heard so many, uh, I have so many conversations and we work with a lot of different types of companies and I just heard the same things said. We have the same needs over, no, but I, I'm unique in this. No, you aren't. There's a lot of the same needs. And there's a lot of, lot of different needs, too. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, proprietary innovation going on. And, um, but, we, you know, we're not talking, we don't need to talk about that. There's a lot of the same needs. When you fall back down as far as you can, you know, into the chemicals or, you know, the dyes, the fibers, the yarns, there's a lot of you are using a lot of the same building block or pre-competitive materials. And uh, that's where we had noticed there just th there's, an there's an opportunity there to you know, share time, resources, cost, and effort. And, you know? and I sense that frustration, but how do you get people to, to overcome it? What's, the, what's the, the, the nugget that gets people to say, hey, we, it's worth us collaborating on that? Well, okay, so there's Caring here, there's H&M here, Eileen Fisher, Stella McCartney, Loom State, Maria Cornejo, maybe they could, um, they're all a part of this initiative through Fashion Positive, and um, maybe you can answer that. <laughs> Go for it, <laughs> take over. Okay. Which Cecilia? Yeah, <laughs> which Cecilia do you want? <laughs> well, let's have uh, Cecilia from H&M With first. a complicated last name. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we truly be believe that uh, collaboration will be the way forward. And I think with Fashion Plus, we see that getting this circular material through and finding these components, it can be yarns, it can be fabrics, but it could also be dye stuff or, I don't know, other kind of materials that we use and finding the common ones that we can take forward and also we can, even though it's only us in, in the collaboration, I think they could be put into the library and everybody could use them. But I think it will go a lot quicker when we do it together than just focusing on, on our perspective or, or on caring, focusing on their perspective. We need to find the common materials, the big materials that really make change and that we can take into scale. Mm. And, that, and that's cross, oh, go on. I think it's really, um, it's really quite important to have these collaborations. We have collaborations across, you know, uh, NGOs and 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 different types of of organizations such as uh, such as um, Fashion Positive Plus, and I think that uh, it's part of our open sourcing uh, philosophy as well that you can't change the business paradigm until you start collaborating with other players in the industry, mm -hmm. um, and I think that having that. Uh, the support of, of innovation as well, of, uh, of being able to provide a sort of hub of, of, of uh, nurturing and, and incubating these, these innovative materials and innovation, uh, you know, these entrepreneurs is quite, is quite uh, important as well. And I think the, an, another way that we can also, that we do collaborations, for example, is we support um, the young designers. I mean, we, we, we work with uh, the Center for Sustainable Fashion, um, Parsons, and other organizations in order to help educate that, that new generation who are going to be working in not just design positions, but also in communication positions, in management positions, in operational positions, right. merchandising, product development, and all that is essential to changing that business paradigm. And I, th I think also the, gr the great work that you guys do at the foundation in terms of bringing people together with a sort of mentality of can we encourage open source thinking and build on each other's experiences and insights because, uh, you know, I think um, at the end of the day there needs to be this mindset of, you know, metaphorically growing the pie to grow everyone's slice of it. And uh, on a slightly sort of uh, left field uh, 
thought I uh, was. Uh, we were having um, dinner last night with the, with the founders of the, the, the Trombo business, and uh, they were say they, they they gave me this book about the secret life of trees. And I know Ken Webster <laughs> at the foundation uh, often mentions this analogy, but you know, I guess in a forest. Uh, uh, a forest is successful kind of collecti collectively and individually. There are different sized trees in it, and it's the collaboration, the incredible networks between the, the plants that make it such an, a successful collective uh, where individuals thrive as well. So I think there's something to be said for we just need a different way of thinking about the way we, we do business. Uh, so. I'm going to borrow that book after you finish with it, Chris. Um, my final question then, we, the... A lot of what we've heard is kind of why a business should do this, about long-term viability, uh, about resource constraints and so on. But why should people in the street get excited by this? Are we, are we asking them to um, believe in the, the, the long-term vision, the altruism, um, the environmental benefits, or is there something else? And I know, Chris, you, you, this is what you spend a lot of your time thinking about. Yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, where perhaps versus some of the narratives in the past is, I think, as you've touched on, Joe, this is very much a narrative of abundance if we can get the system right. Uh, so this is not about necessarily, you know, limiting ourselves in terms of what we can enjoy in our lives. This is about uh, uh, sort of a celebration almost of, of kind of design and, 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 uh, and, and what we can make and enjoy. Uh, so I think there's something to be said for that thought. And I think there's also this really interesting narrative around regeneration. So if I'm rather than in the past maybe thinking as a user I have to minimize my impact. I think that by proxy, by, by buying from brands that are participating in circular systems, how can that, that, how can that be an opportunity to sort of almost maximize my impact? So it's a much more positive narrative, I think. And uh, I think that's potentially quite exciting. Then I guess the other, and, and, I, and I love the, uh, it's been mentioned a couple of times, this idea of, you know, it, it's kind of more considered design. It's more elegant design if it works in a circular system. And I think that that idea is very linked to quality. And I, and I love the the H and M line around denim, around denim reborn. I just think it's kind of a it, it, it makes you think quite in a sort of really sort of fresh and exciting way about about the, the kind of brand and what it's doing. I think. Um I think just more, more broadly, there's an interesting question around what might society be like when it becomes circular. This isn't just going to be about consumer goods. Uh, and I think that's a really interesting question. And um, you know, I think there's all sorts of uh, inevitable technologies, uh, or, or the, the direction that technologies are taking, in it, take, taking us in is uh, there's some inevitability around a, a localizing of the economy, to be honest. And I think that it, there could be some really interesting thoughts around communities of more shared economic interest, uh, of, of, of different kind of quality of life, and we're investing more in natural capital and things like that. So I think there's, a, a, you know, if you're not into this already, explore the idea of circular cities. I think it's a really interesting uh, sort of uh, uh, other aspect of why this might matter to the man in the street. Because at the end of the day, if it doesn't, if it's not about better quality of life, then uh, going back to my point around purpose, why are we doing this? So, yeah. And H&M, the, the marketing <coughs> has been very bold around uh, these terms around closing the loop and circular economy. Yeah. Clearly, that's part of it as well, the, the, how this lands with the customer. Yeah, I think we see that we have a really important role to spread the awareness that all textiles is not waste, it's a resource. And I think from our perspective, no, the people are not aware, I think, today the majority of, or what I should say, not all customers are conscious customers. So therefore, I think we should not only focus on making sustainable fashion, but really to make sustainability fashionable. And we heard it before, we used to say it at h and <laughs> but I think working uh, towards a customer with these kind of marketing campaigns, of course, is, is a way for us to do it. And I, I think it all came up when we started with the Garment Collecting Initiative. We did a tour around high schools in Sweden. And we were talking to the teenagers and like, would you consider to leave your goods to H&M for reuse and recycling, and they were like, never. <laughs> I would be so embarrassed. What do you think, I'm poor? <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of the mindset that we met, and we were quite shocked, because of course we were so convinced that everybody thinks this is a great idea, but it didn't. So, and we asked them, what would make you do it then? Well, if Slatan was doing it, and I don't know, you're more into fashion than football, but Slatan was at the time, <laughs> and still is maybe the most famous Swedish football player. So if he did it, they could consider. And I think that's where kind of the thought about making fashion sustainable and sustainability fashion fashionable came up. And yeah, we did campaigns with MIA, for example, Iggy Pop, maybe it's a bit too old for them. But anyhow, <laughs> we have the Bring It campaign now, uh, really kind of, showing that, yeah, sustainability can really be fashionable. 
slatternized the fashion. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. That's a hashtag. <laughs> that is definitely a hashtag. <laughs> I'm going to open up for some questions from the audience straight away. One down there. We have a mic that's going to travel around. We'll go to this one just at the back here. Um, my question is for Cecilia from H&M. Um, I'm just wondering if H&M um, has any initiatives that they're going to cut down on the clothes they're producing because I think you guys are doing some great things and you have a voice that can make a lot of change, but you're still really producing more clothes than can be consumed by society. I think, as I said, we really see that we need to decouple growth from the use of finite resources. And that will happen in a lot of different ways. And that's why we set up this strategy of the holistic approach to circularity, which entails reuse, recycling, but also different ways of maintaining the products. And of course, we want our customers to wear the products. We don't want them to throw, throw them away or not using them. We want them to love them and to care for them. So I think. We, but we also see that there is an increased demand from the growing middle class, class population. And we want to make fashion affordable and available for everyone. But we don't want to make fashion that nobody wears. Because that's, of course, the worst business model in the world. We don't want to do that. We still want to be profitable, but within a sustainable way. And I think a circular approach and 100% circular vision and only using recycled or sustainably sourced material. It's a, it's a way to do that. But we're at the beginning of this journey, and we're still finding our recipe, as I said. And there will be different ways to do that. And we're promoting reuse uh, a lot through the Garment Collecting Initiative, but we also invested in a company called Selfie, for example, who's providing uh, cells resells goods on the Swedish version of eBay. So there will be a lot of different ways of reusing, and there will be a lot of different ways of taking care of the clothes in a good way. We have repair, uh, repair guidelines on, or repair tips and tricks on our website, for example. We have the Clever Care label in our, our garments on how you can reduce the environmental impact when you care for your clothes. So I think, yeah, we're in the beginning, but of course we need to find the right way to do it. I think it's a... Uh, it's a uh, Michael Braungart's analogy, I think, um, of a, a cherry tree doesn't try and reduce the amount that it that produces. It, it's abundant, but it doesn't have that negative impact. I wish I could take credit for that uh, rather poetic analogy, but I really can't. Um, <laughs> but but and it's a it's a it's an idealized vision. But I, I guess that's there's no shame in aiming for something that's uh, a, a future that is that is uh, appealing and bold. It's it it can regenerate off of itself. It's constantly, when you think of the cherry tree, it's just, you know, the, it, it grows, the cherries, they fall, they go back into the soil. We have so many examples of that, mm. you know, the hydrologic, you know, system. And um, is it a question? I, I don't know. I don't want to get into that, that the consumerism part, but I think, I think we all have a, a sort of, we're all empowered and we all have a sort of responsibility. And, um, we all have individual decisions to make, mm -hmm. you know, and I think the goal here is to circulate what we have. You know, there's there's a lot we already have, and right now it's going, you know, we had um, Lydia Schmidt from ICO present uh, uh, a few days ago, and she talked about the amount of textiles, um, what did she say, the amount that are going into landfill? I mean, it's just, it's, it's an incredible amount that's that's really not being reused. Um, and, and especially in America is really scary, but there's a huge opportunity for us. There's a, hu there's a huge source of materials, mm -hmm. you know? And so what, why don't we uh, get smart and intelligent about reusing the materials that we already have? And that's, that's what you've been talking about, Cecilia, is cycling, cycling the materials that we already have. Um, and so you'll, st you'll start to see circular design and circularity is about the use of recyc using recycled materials, ongoing, having innovations to be able to not downcycle them at the next phase, but continuously virgin, you know, virgin quality materials over and over. That's becoming possible. Mm. More questions. There was one just here. At the most awkward place for the uh, microphone to get to. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I have a question for Chris, because I talk to these fantastic ladies a lot anyway. So, Chris, 
how do we make, the, this kind of follows on what you were talking about, um, the outreach and education. How do we get out of this image of um, circular fashion in the form of cartoons? No um, offense to Copenhagen Fashion Summit who made another cartoon, but I'm just, I'm just really tired of seeing um, this kind of um, marketing campaigns that, are, that look like they're aimed at you know, first graders. So I think IDEO is uniquely positioned to make this message into something that resonates with you know, us and as a more sophisticated, media savvy um, consumers of content. So can IDEO do that? Well, uh, we definitely can't do it on our own. Um, uh, just like anything else in, 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 this, in this circular game. I think, um, uh, look, sometimes, um, sometimes the, we, the user doesn't necessarily need to, to kind of uh, always kind of know kind of what's, what's going on. We don't need to, I think the challenge is how do you present something very, very complex? I mean, at the end of the day, if we present just a better product experience or a new kind of service idea, um, it should sort of speak for itself. I think it's then sort of interesting if you've got sort of super users, how do you then kind of give them an extra sense of participation in the brand? And I think that's, that's kind of this idea that these circular loops become more participatory. They, they allow for more tailoring and performance of the product, for us to learn a lot more about that user as part of potentially the circulation of materials. That, that, um, so I think there are, there are kind of experiences they will have that will kind of get better and better, potentially. Uh, so it's not always about the narrative, it's about the experience as well. Um, and that should speak for itself. Um, and if we're really people-centric, then we will stay rooted on that. Um, but I, think, I do think, as I said, I mentioned, you know, there's some interesting new aspects of the narrative uh, where I think, you know, we can talk about, you know, as sort of helping people have a more sort of positive impact on the world uh, in a way that we've kind of written off maybe in the past to people don't want to sort of make these choices. Well, if we're presenting them with a better experience and we're saying, and look, there's an opportunity for you to play a part in something here, uh, you don't need to do anything about it, but you're kind of, you're not an end. Of, it's not, no one likes to think that they're at the end of a pipe. It feels kind of terminal, doesn't it? But if you're a, if you're a loop, if you're a loop, then that's kind of an interesting idea as well. So I think there's things companies are starting to explore. Well, I, haven't, I haven't got the golden answer, I'm afraid. You know, this is like anyone else. I'm just feeling my way. But I think, um, uh, I think there are some exciting narrative start points flickering out there. Uh, I agree it shouldn't all be sort of simplified, but it sh the experiences should talk for themselves at the end of the day. Yeah. And if Chris isn't going to mention it, I will. Um, IDEO actually worked on an exhibition uh, called Never Finished. Uh, never finished. Which I, I would argue is a good example of illustrating some of these ideas in a in a in a kind of a system or service experience way um, that is quite um, quite mature yeah. and isn't just uh, cartoon owls and we, we did like a that. blog post with smart <laughs> things will save the world on our, on our idea blog and it's kind of about about that better everyday experiences. Uh, from there are some many more questions. This gentleman in the front row. Thank you, good afternoon, and thank you for sharing all this. Um, we heard a lot about circular design, about supply chains, also about uh, a little bit about customer awareness, especially in the end. Um, this is still, fashion is still a profit-driven activity, so customer is very essential in there, is very central in there. And I was wondering, we heard H&M and what they do, I think there's a lot of things done by uh, high street brands, but I was wondering what luxury and high-end is doing, that's a question to, to Cecilia Takeyama, uh, to uh, work on customer awareness as well. Well, I think that um, for luxury, it's, uh, it's extremely important for, for our brands to be within their, their DNA. So, for example, for Stella McCartney is a brand that's uh, is very uh, vocal about, about what they're doing for sustainability and sustainable products. And I think that, that is within their DNA. And I think that if, uh, first and foremost, brands have to remain loyal to their creative DNA because this is why the customers come into the shop in the first place and they have to create the products. I think the products also in and of themselves, the fact that we are making extremely high quality products coming from extremely uh, good raw materials, and, these, and this is where we're going through the supply chain and, and going through to, this, to the raw materials and that we're able to create these products that can, that can have value to the consumers. Um, I think that uh, luxury consumers are, are, are very different than, than, say, your sports consumers who, who are very 
cognizant of the, of the environment and their impact. We're not there yet, perhaps, but I think it will be. And I think that also for, for luxury, these, these items about circular design and these aspects of, of sustainability are in fact embedded in our business. They're embedded in how uh, the quality that we're looking at, the quality of the, of the, of the items that we're producing. Thank you. There were, I think we've got about five minutes left, roughly. Uh, one of the two at the back there. Where about? Can you put your hand up? All right. Hello, my name is Nina. Um, we're at the Solutions Lab upstairs in the Future Fabrics Expo, showing lots of fantastic sustainable materials that are exciting and inspiring. <laughs> um, I want to ask the panel. Do you think sustainable materials still have a bad image, and how do you intend to change that? I mean, when I say bad image, I mean sort of woolly, hempy, uh, perceived by the customer, by the consumers. And well, <laughs> who wants that? Who, who wants it? Hot potato. <laughs> Andy, why don't you get us started? Seeing as uh, materials has been a focus. What's the question again? I do <coughs> do sustainable materials have? any negative image, woolly, hempy, uh, any sort of environmentally uh, or, 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 or um, a bit hippy? That's the impression I got from the question. I mean, not, not what I've been working on. Not, not that jacket, not <laughs> this dress, not what I've been wearing in the last couple of days, not the materials that Nina has in her library upstairs. Some of them are cradle to cradle certified. They look, they actually look a lot like other mm -hmm. materials and, and, and I, I know the story behind them. So to me, they're a lot uh, more beautiful, but I, I don't, I just, I don't pay attention to that much anymore. I hear it come up and I just think, hey, uh, come over here. Let me show you something a bit more interesting. And we've come a long way since, you know, uh, the 90s. Yeah. Not talking about that anymore. We're talking <laughs> about something a lot more interesting and innovative. I think the prejudices still still exist. Um, when you call something recycled, it doesn't tend to have a very, it doesn't bring to mind extremely high quality. It's <laughs> but yet, in fact, I think when you actually get really deep into the supply chain, you'll find that there are, that it actually, it can almost be, it can be as good, if not better. It, it, and in terms of even raw materials, if you're looking at sustainable raw materials, they're actually, the quality of how animals are raised, for example, will affect the fibers, which then affect the quality of your materials. So it's actually, uh, it's unfortunate that that prejudice still exists, and that's part of the reason why we are working so hard within uh, educating young designers to make them understand where these materials come from, what impacts do the material choices have, and the fact that beautiful materials, which are in fact sustainable, do exist. And it takes sometimes matter uh, of, of people ha having to touch them and feel them and see them and, uh, and to get rid of those prejudices. And I, and I strongly believe that over time, those prejudices will go away. Yeah, and I think we have an important role as brands to, to play here, to show that, mm -hmm. that we can make beautiful looking fabrics out of sustainable materials. And that's why we have these conscious collections, conscious exclusive collections, for example, that me and Anna, Annie is showing off here on stage, but, <laughs> or the Denim Reborn for that sake. I think we will only use recycled or sustainably sourced material by 2030. And we really hope that, of course, that would be materials that are equally good or better than the materials today. Because in order to make this to happen at scale, they need to be equally good. Otherwise, it would never kind of take off. Mm. There were, I'm going to move on to a couple more questions. Still over this side, there's still two more. And then I'll... Okay, sorry, I'm angled the wrong way. This is my, <laughs> this is my field of vision. I'll have to turn. <laughs> Hi, thanks everybody for your wonderful work. This is for Cecilia Takayama. Um, I'm wondering, you mentioned that, like so many brands, you don't own your supply chain. And it seems like a perfect opportunity for collaboration. And I'm wondering if you have tried or um, have thought about collaborating with other brands who manufacture in the factories where you do business, or for anyone else on the panel. Well, um, we already actually have quite a lot of brands in our group. So <laughs> we actually, uh, when we approach the supply chain, 
uh, we approach them as caring. And that's part of the advantage of having a department um, such as the Materials Innovation Lab, because it's not just one, uh, perhaps a smaller brand who doesn't have that much volume going to a supplier and saying, can you change this for me? Uh, and by the way, I only have I you know, X hundred meters that I'm ordering from you every year. If you go to them as a group, as we do, uh, and to negotiate with these suppliers, we actually are able to do that. Um, we do a lot of uh, cross-brand collaborations um, because we work with, you know, with major organizations and nonprofits and, and collaborations, and that's how we can work on, on getting that message across. You know, for example, with ZDHC, we're working with other brands on, on these kind of organizational movements, which then we can go to our supply chain and say, look, we are working on X organization. We are working on X movement of ZDHC or this, this type of compliance uh, certification. And they will, they put it together because they know also another luxury brand is coming to them. And so we're able to approach it in, in that way um, because, of course, we do have to be careful of antitrust uh, issues as well. Um, and we have to come at it from a pre competitive point of view as well. But yes, the reality is, of course, we do have very similar supply chains when you come to luxury, especially. Um, but we keep aware of what, we try to keep aware of what other competitors are doing. We know where we can push also as a group level uh, to really push our suppliers and, ma and make them move. I'm going to go into mean moderator mode now and ask for some quick fire answers to some of these questions that I have neglected, especially from this side of the room. Uh, you've probably been very patient, so uh, thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dorothy from House of Fraser, running the sustainability program. I wanted to know, particularly from uh, Cecilia, both Cecilias, um, where you see the next scalable fibers. We've got the recycled wools, the recycled cottons, the recycled polyesters. Besides some of the more niche fibers out there, what do you see as the next really scalable, doable ones in the mainstream? You go first so I can think about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I really see that now the next thing will be the chemical recycling of both polyester and cotton. That will take off. And that when that happens, then then that's when we will go and be able to go to scale. Because the, to be honest, mechanical recycling is good, but it has its limitations. So the chemical recycling of cotton into viscose or lyocell or, or kind of man-made cellulosic fibers or Polyester that goes into polyester, that would be a really big thing. But then, of course, we have these exciting innovations like uh, what we kind of accelerate with the Global Change Award. Uh, the grape leather, for example, the winner from this year, I think it's super interesting and it could be really scalable listening to them. So that could also be an alternative. And alternative to leather is something that we at least request a lot of innovation around. And that was also part of the discussions that we had with the the uh, Credit to Credit Fashion Plus group yesterday. So there are a lot of areas where we need innovation and, and a lot of things happening. I really see that there's a momentum, actually. Uh, so that's, that's positive news, I think. Um, I think that, uh, well, I agree with recycled polyesters. I think recycled nylons as well. Um, and I think that... Um, I think that that question actually brings to, to the highlights the point that how, how, how difficult it is to, to, to scale up those innovative fibers. Um, and I wish there were more magic answers to scale up those kind of fibers because I think that they have a lot of value. But we must not uh, forget that they have, to, they have to be in and of themselves economically viable. They have, to be, uh, they have to be of high quality, and they have to be performant. And these are very hard characteristics for uh, extremely innovative um, startup fibers to, to, to fill. Um, but it's all part of us keeping an eye on them and helping them and, and giving them the parameters of what we need and what needs to get uh, into an oper oper operational industrialized system and not stay on the fringes. And that's part of the, the role that I think we play in terms of collaborating with these innovative startups. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to take two more if they're out there. You've been very patient. Mm. Hello, thank you. Um, my question is for the whole panel, actually. Um, you spoke a lot about shared value creation and um, collaboration. My particular question would be, uh, what do you think that um, new leadership practices or thinking is needed in order to foster circularity on an organizational or entire systemic level? Yeah, I guess it's 
um, I guess it's really about helping people understand, on one level, the system they're really in. I mean, that there's a fundamental mindset, mindset shift when one moves from a linear economy way of thinking to a circular economy way of thinking. It's, it's a, a totally different horizon. You make totally different decisions in your business. Um, and that's a very powerful thing. I think that understanding the system you're really in, the ecosystem you're really in, the relationships you really have to things, the true cost of being hitched to finite natural resources, and the true cost of the, the waste you create and don't do anything with, I think is really, really, um, is, 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 a, is, a, is, a, is a, as much a mindset issue as, as anything else. So it's how do we, how do we kind of create the, the right sort of mindset, and uh, and and that's that's not an easy thing to do. But I think at the end of the day, that's that's what we have to kind of uh, um, build towards. Is that, that partly answer your question? Yes, thank you. I've just been uh, given a signal from stage left, um, so I'm going to have to draw the session to a close. So my last question is just going to ask you guys to give our panel a fantastic round of applause for their insights today. <laughs> Good job. Thanks. <laughs>